Anyway. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, okay, so we're looking at you and living first aid. First aid. Now, in the course of the week, Alero, we know what happened at the National Assembly and all the all the drama around there. Um, the NDDC MD had acting an, had an acting MD had Thank an you. issue, and um, it was chaotic. But in in the pictures that surfaced after that, it was obvious that a lot of people that did not understand the first thing to do when there is a health situation hmm. about first aid. What do you do? S similarly, in, a, in, a, in an organization I heard about, there was a fire alarm that went up, a fire incident, and everybody's supposed to gather at the master point. Master point, yeah. And then roll call is done. Hmm. Guess what? They gathered, scattered, not at the master point. And then do roll call. What do you do? Safety measures and protocol what do you do? Okay, so today on You and Living, we're looking at first aid. What to do when things don't look too good? What do you do? So to help us um, understand all of this, um, we have Adube Augustine, a paramedic, a Rescue Technologies Limited, with over five years of extensive professional experience handling medical emergencies. He joins us from our Abuja studio. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, you are. Okay. Good morning to you in the studio in Lagos. Uh, good. Um, we're expecting the head of training, field officer, International Committee of the Red Cross to join us here in the Lagos studio. But let's start with you, um, Mr. Augustine. What, in the face of the things that happen around, I mean, emergency situations arise here and there sometimes. They're not, when emergency situations are not things you prepare for. But what have you observed as regards how people react when there's need, when something goes awry and needs emergency attendance? Hello, can you come again with a question, please? Okay. I'm saying, what have you observed in our society, in our climb, when there's an emergency situation as regards admission, uh, administering first aid? What have you observed? Uh, most time it's a chaotic situation. Uh, you also see people use it as an opportunity to make their own uh, local home video. Uh, instead of taking time out to save the life of somebody who is affected, some people would be snapping. The general attitude to people in time of, emer of people in time of emergency is actually not commendable. However, it's also good to acknowledge that uh, within the space of some time that we've been working with a lot of people, we work with road safety, we work with uh, uh, a religious group. This is gradually changing. But uh, the problem is among the elites, the, the, the perception of responding in time of emergency is still very, very low. And this has always kept us worried uh, in, in the real sense because most times these things happen and people are left to die with, with little or no assistance. And even when the assistance comes, the wrong first aid is being administered by this people. Now, talking about um, first aid, I, I want us to watch a very short clip. Um, what we're going to play now is the scene after he fainted. This is him being carried out. I just want you to see this so that you can picture, and then let's we'll now look at what should be done. So let's have that. It's a very short clip. <laughs> Now, even at that, the picture you saw there, even the way the, for the acting MD of the NDTC was being led out or carried out, is that the best way to have done it? No. No in the sense, yes, no in the sense that uh, there are no trained uh, first respondents in the premises as at that time. 
Uh, obviously, those who might have been trained also lost the competence because when we're looking at first aid, first aid is not just the knowledge, it's a combination of the KCC, the knowledge, the competence, and the confidence. Most of them, from the clip, from the entire clip, you discover that somebody have the knowledge, but they didn't have the competence. And even those, at the end of the day, people who have the confidence don't have the competence as well. So for taking him in out within the space where this incident happened, in a normal society, as enacted by the law of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, sometimes I don't know whether to be happy that this incident actually happened and the, at the seat of legislature, because I, in the, in the uh, Workplace Safety Act of 1990, the same legislators enact the act that every workplace should have trained first aiders, trained emergency respondents. Now, if in 1990 this act was enacted by the legislators, now an incident happened in their own domain, we couldn't find any first respondent running to provide, to produce, provide a professional first aid, workplace first aid skill, then it keeps us worried uh, in the sense of uh, the Nigeria thing. So I uh, also want to say that we should take an opportunity. This is a lesson to everybody. This is a lesson to the political class. This is a lesson to business moguls. Because if ordinarily you approach the acting MD of the NDDC like six months ago that you need to train your personnel on first aid, it will tell you first aid is useless, we, we have hospitals. But today it has happened to him, and that's to tell you, if really the situation had gone out of hand, he could have lost his life. And if he had the knowledge, obeying the ENAC law, workplace first aid law of 1990, and his aide, his, aid, his driver, his cook, and everybody has been trained, if they have emergency respondents in the House of Assembly, you're very, very sure, will show that nobody will die as a situation, as a, as, a, as a result of sudden emergency. We know they are destined deaths, but they are also what we call preventable deaths. If we have this in place, I assure you that the preventable death will actually be prevented effectively in its own. Okay, we've been joined by Paul Orokumaya, who's a state head of training, field officer, International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you for joining us. Okay, August. Okay, okay. So there was a mix-up here. Yeah, but ah. now this matter. If we're well, we're talking to uh, last respondent here, who's talking about what is done, the situation after the acting MD of the NDDC um, had his Collapsed. incident, mm. how he was carried out the amount of crowd around him. Mm. Is it a question of, well, obviously it's a question of maybe ignorance, but I'm sure there are some people there who are medical personnel. Is it that sometimes people lose their confidence as against competence? How does it happen? Um, basically, um, that was an unfortunate um, situation. But um, for me, I feel it is a gathering, and a gathering of more than, say, 50 um, um, parliament um, personnel. Parliamentarians. Yes, they ought to have a an ambulance or a medic on board. You know that's why we have. They say the they have a hospital there. Yeah, they do, but you, they need to have a trained personnel in, in the chamber in the in the building, so that in case of an emergency, mm -hmm. the personnel will go for to attend to it. Okay. The crowd is not even you know, ideal in that Not kind of helping. situation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But the fact that um, they don't have it, mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, a problem regarding the health of people in there. Okay. So that's why there's a need to, you know, conduct training for personnel that probably work there or um, maybe even people, companies should mm -hmm. have it. Okay. Yeah. I, I recall that uh, when the doctor who dealt with him at the hospital when he was taken to... Um, said that um, someone faints, you don't try and get him on his feet. You're supposed to lie him down. Um, in that clip, we saw that they immediately got him up. 
and took him out of the chamber. What could possibly have happened to him in that situation since the correct thing was not done, which was to lie him down? Well, worst case scenario, he would collapse. Because as a matter of fact, if someone faints, you know, you need to put that person lying, like you said. I was going to say, you know. In a recovery position. Okay. You know, before the arrival of uh, medic trained, okay. or trained personnel. Okay. You so, don't rush the person out. Even if you want to take the person out, you ought to use a stretcher. proper equipment to take the person out. Okay. Walking is putting the person on extra and um, uh, more danger. So someone, someone faints. What do you do? Okay, if someone... As, as far as first aid is concerned, before medics arrive. If someone faints, yeah. first thing you want to do as a um, first aider mm -hmm. is to seek the person's consent if the person is a bit conscious. Because you might, you know, just close your eyes, but you are still conscious there. Okay. If there's no response, okay, you try to check for rising and um, falling of the chest. That's how we get to do that. You know, if you don't detect any breathing, that's a possibility of a heart attack. So you probably need to now commence CPR, cardiopulmonary uh, resuscitation. So before oh, we'll, we'll come to that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, go on, oh, go, go on. on. <laughs> okay, so before you, you know, um, call for help, more so when you are trying to, you know, do all of that, you need to call for help immediately because you cannot do it alone. Okay. Yeah, and then you tell the crowd to, you know, make room for cross ventilation. Because the person will need it at that point in time. So at, at the point in time, the, the, the man was slumped over the table. Uh -huh. What should have happened is immediately clear the seats there, right? Yes. And lie him down. And lie him down lie on him the floor. Down. Or lie him down on the table, whichever one is whichever. more convenient. Mm. But he must be flat. Yes. Not to stand up. Not to stand or up. Or not to lean back on the chair. Yes. But why... Okay, the, before you came in, Paul was talking about what many people do at that point in time. They, that's an opportunity to do their self, their homemade videos yes. for social media. What causes that thing about, I need, to cap I need to capture this? Is that the biggest thing that we should be looking at? Well, it's unfortunate that um, the world today is um, strictly um, emphasizing on putting something up and you know, getting views when there's a critical situation at hand. So I feel it's not supposed to be. You know, the good, um, the, I'll put it, um, um, a, a good Samaritan will probably decide to see how they can help. You know, first, if you have someone that is a trained personnel, he identifies that, ah, I'm a trained personnel. He goes in, and then if he needs assistance, they support. Mm. But people get to capture the whole thing, and it's, it's, it's happening in our world today. It's strange that beside him was sitting also a medical officer. Was a, a medical person was sitting beside mm. him, but mm. he didn't move as one would have thought he would have moved, mm. seeing that he sees him um, every day. Well, truth is, doctors and nurses, they are trained for um, hospital care. There's what they call pre-hospital care, you know. So there are certain situations whereby a doctor will not want to do the wrong thing because he doesn't have that experience. Because this is an emergency. Mm -hmm. And there are people that are trained, paramedics, first aiders, that are trained to do this task. Okay. You know? So mm -hmm. if a doctor tries to, he might you know, not do it right. Okay. Because this mm -hmm. is a pre-hospital situation. Okay, there's... Uh, Paul. Um, to, to yeah, it. Paul, Paul. Yeah, Paul. Um, the doctor who attended to the acting MD also referred to someone sticking their finger in his mouth and another one trying to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in this time of COVID. And I know from when I was a little girl in primary school that when people faint in, con in this country, you stick your finger or you stick a spoon, spoon actually. between their teeth. What is the essence of that? Uh, uh, first, I think it is good for us to maybe take a replay of what happened there in the studio and see what could have been done, what, what should be do, done, and then we'll come back to look at the second part, the, the, the secondary part and circumstances. So if you permit me, I want to take my mother by going Obviously, she fence like this, 
like what happened in the uh, uh, House of Assembly, and I need to follow the COVID-19 protocol by protecting myself, and immediately get to a hello, hello, you need to bring her back. The, the reason why we have to bring her back immediately is first to maintain an open airways. Secondly, like my colleague said in the studio there, we have to bring her out of this chair and put her down. You need to lie her down. When you lie her down, you need to understand that anybody who, be, who is fainting is actually short of breath. So you need to bring her head towards this direction, which we call opening of the airway. Because of her air, we need to clear it very well. You need to get a hand to support her like this and bring forth this arm like this. If you do this, you discover that you've maintained an open airway. Then you need to clear. Because I am personally alone, I didn't focus on the clearing, but I focus on making sure that she has means of survival, which is the oxygen supply, by opening her airways like this. In this time of COVID, for me to come in contact with anybody, you need to use a protective jar by putting on an hand glove. You need to have your shield. You need to have your face shield well covering yourself before you need to deal with the person. And when you get this person down like this, I assure you, within a space of five minutes, anybody that fainted will come back to normal. If the person has gone, if the person fainted or become unconscious, that's where we have problem. If they have just done this, clear the entire table from from the man at, as of, at, the, as of, at the House of Assembly, I assure you that in five minutes, when the clinic in the, hospital, in, the, in the House of Assembly will come, this man would have recovered in full force. Again, when somebody is fainting, the person needs oxygen because he fainted as a result of shortage of oxygen in the system, towards the, in the brain. So you need to make sure that the person has a well-ventilated environment like this. Now, when you talk about the COVID-19 in itself, when we talk about the COVID-19 in itself, we look at a lot of things. You have to protect yourself, which is the principal rule in first aid. Protect yourself, protect people around you, and then protect the victim itself. The man who tried to blow air into the man's mouth, again, he has what we call the knowledge, but he doesn't have the competence. He has confidence, but he doesn't have the competence. The competence means that he, was he might have been trained in first aid that when somebody becomes unconscious, you need to give a match to match resuscitation. However, if he has the competence, he should know that somebody who is fainting is actually not unconscious and not breathing. You need to look through the process, because where, you get, where people get it wrong is when somebody is unconscious and not breathing, you cannot do for that person what I just did for my colleague right now. You cannot do that for the same person right, uh, that, uh, in such situation. Meanwhile, if the person just fainted, if the person uh, obviously is not breathing, and you do this for the person, you're giving the person a quick death on itself then putting COVID-19 into consideration in general. People, it makes people more scared. But for the Nigerian Red Cross, today we have migrated into a new protocol in first aid. Uh, the new protocol is what we call the COVID-19 uh, prevention protocol. For you to be able to attend to anybody, you should put on your glove, you should put on your face mask or a face shield. Most time for us, it is preferably, if you see most of our colleagues today, they are all kitted with the face shield. And the ones in the field will also advise them when they responded because like four days ago, there was a serious explosion around Cocoa in Delta State. And our team were on ground, fully kitted in the COVID-19 protocol. But for the one in the House of Assembly, for example, uh, if, you, if, you, if the, the House of Assembly follow the normal standard safety protocol. In every sitting, they're supposed to have trained first aiders or trained paramedics. You know, I happen to be in the two side because uh, I am a certified paramedics. You, you need to have a paramedics in the building 
we're not talking about the hospital in the as of assembly complex because this is where they tend to make mistakes. For the person who is there, uh, we talked about the doctor himself who was there. Uh, my colleague have made it clear, and my colleague in the studio in Lagos have made it clear. The, the job for the uh, uh, pre-hospital care is not the same as the clinical care. However, there are laws that have been neglected in Nigeria, which is not good. Many years ago, for you to study medicine in your 100 level, you must pass first aid as a course, and it's done as an elective course, where the Red Cross is invited to the university to take the medical students on uh, advanced cardiac life support. We do the training for them as an elective course before they progress to their 200 level. Today, it's no longer in place. It's no longer in place. That is why you will see some medical doctors in the field, uh, outside the clinic, look at people who are dying and might not be able to do things because they are all focused in the clinical stage. So we are trying to say in this stead, because if we don't get this right, most people that died from road traffic accident actually do not die because the doctors are incompetent in the hospital. They die because of the damage that is caused between the accident uh, scene and the hospital. All Paul, the complications Paul, you see if Paul, resulting from... Uh, uh, okay, Paul, um, we might just hold on. We would come back to you to take us through the demonstration in the applying first aid. Take us through a demonstration again uh, to wind down. But let's, let me come back here to Augustine. Augustine, in, in applying or administering first aid, what should be the first thing? So people talk about the three Ps and all of that. What yes. should be the first things? What should be the focus of the person that's about to ad administer first aid? Okay. Um, first, uh, before you administer first aid, you need to um, determine the um, safety of the environment. You know, they said your, your safety first before you attend to the person because you cannot be a dead hero. You're trying to help somebody and then you die. And then about the three Ps, it's, um, it's a rule that every first aider should abide by. Um, first, it's to um, preserve, um, preserve um, health. That's for you to preserve the life. You know, the next P is to promote recovery. And then the third P is to um, um, prevent, injury. prevent further injury. So these three Ps are very important as a first responder. So now, after you check for um, safety of the scene, the next thing you want to do is to call the person on the floor to seek their consent, to know if they can respond so that you will know whatever it is, especially when you're not at the scene when it happened. Mm -hmm. So when, once you get to do that and you, you find out that the person is not responding back to you, so you go further to... Um, um, and provide help. Now, the, the, the essence of this is to do this right so that you are able to preserve or save that life. So as a first responder, especially in this COVID-19 era, you need to look out for yourself. So you have to have your uh, personal protective equipment. You know, you wear your gloves and then you have your face mask on. And then if there is a need for you to, um, you know, um, breathe to the person. You ought to, you know, have your own personal um, 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 nose uh, mask so that you get to use that to respond at that point in time. So once you go there, you call for the attention, there's no breathing and all of that, and then you ought to now check for the person's pulse. Normally, um, if I have a mannequin here, I would just show you how it is, but let me just show you. You try to check for the pulse just you know, from this midline to the end here, you just put your hand a bit down to confirm if the person has a pulse. Because you can, you know, there are two things a paramedic should be able to uh, figure out. Whether the person is breathing or it has a pulse. You know, one of the two might, you know, be a thing to consider. So if you don't find a pulse, that means the person is out. So you need to start, you know, providing CPR so that you can trans, you, you, you be the manual support the person needs before the arrival of further help. Okay. I feel so to what, what if, you, if, you, if you do this, you feel the pulse, yes. right, that's just below the 
the neckline the neck here, yes. below the chin here. So you do that, you feel the pulse, but the person is not breathing. Do you begin to do the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation at yes, that time? Yes, you still have to do or that. Which one do you do first, the pumping of the chest or the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation? Okay, um, normally, the pumping of the chest is important, you know, because sometimes, especially when it's not safe, especially in the COVID-19 era, you don't want to, you know, try to breathe into the person. Mm. What you're doing by doing CPR, is to ensure that the heart is able to pump blood to the brain. The brain, in about four minutes, if the brain doesn't get oxygen, it's dead. Is dead. Mm. So you are trying to do that. Even if that is what you are able to do to save that life at that instant, do it. Okay. You know, but it's important. It's a 30-20 um, um, sequence. You do 30 chest compression and then, um, sorry, I said 20, two um, breath. So 30 chest compression and then two breath. You do that, you do it again, you do that. So you keep doing that until you're able to get a rhythm. A rhythm is for the heart to just come back to start, um, you know, beating on its, uh, on its own. Mm -hmm. But if that is not possible, especially when you call for help, AED comes in, they apply that and, you know, shock. Uh, Augustine, mm -hmm. the question that I had asked Paul, which he didn't respond to, why do people tend to want to put their finger or a spoon in somebody's mouth who has fainted? Okay. Um, Thank you for bringing that question back because I was going to, you know, reiterate that. Um, there's what is called seizures. And once a person is having seizures, you know, it's especially um, 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 something where with um, people that are um, epileptic. So seizures would um, cause your tongue to try to block your airway. So what they are trying to do is to bring back the tongue. Like you said, there are maneuvers we do now that have, you know, changed over you time. Nobody wants you to use a spoon anymore. You know, it is not supposed to be. It could happen. Seizures, most time, if, if it, well, since it's um, pre-hospital care we're looking at here. So what you try, you need to do is try to secure a hair, airway. Don't try to put your hand in the person's uh, mouth. You know, you don't want to do that. Sometimes you can even choke the person. You know, so try to put the person in recovery position. And once you are having seizures, your nerves are stiff, your legs, your feet, and then the tongue. So try to get that. If you are able to secure an airway, you know. And then the right thing to do also is if you have something that is um, um, in the clinic, they call it spatula, um, but medics, we have what we use, um, oropharyngeal airway. It, it so will, use that too. Bro, <laughs> there is, you don't have a pharyngeal airway. Yeah. I'm here now. Something is happening. What do I do to get that airway you're talking about so that the tongue doesn't go up to block his airway and all that? What do we do in an emergency? This is an emergency. An emergency. There is, we can't use spoon. I can't put my finger. But I need to ensure that something goes to stop his tongue from going up and all of that. What do I do? Okay, so... What can um, I use? <laughs> Well, you said, what can I use? You can use your hands. Can you use your hands? Yes, your fingers goes in to bring down the tongue so that it allows for um, airflow. Air, air flow. But sometimes some book of, uh, school of thought will tell you to allow it to take its course and make sure that once the person has stopped, you should monitor to make sure that the person okay. has... I think uh, Paul was supposed to demonstrate something before we let you go. Paul, quick demonstration, please. Real quick, you have 20 seconds. Before the demonstration... Before the demonstration, let's, let's have something clear. There's a difference between a paramedic and a first aider. And when you talk about putting something on the hand, putting into consideration the safety of the person. If you put your hand in the mat of somebody's having seizure and it closes its teeth against your hand, you could lose that finger from there. So it's a no-no-go area in, in the new first aid protocol for us. And also the new first aid protocol in line with COVID-19 says that we should do without the mat-to-match -mat respiration if you are a lay first aider, unless you are a paramedic that have the ambo bag. We don't want to come into that because those are advanced state. But for the man on the road, please don't put your hands in the fing uh, uh, your, your fingers in the mat of the person. Just make sure you have an open airway for your own safety. So we would have to come back. If you permit me, I will have to come back to the demonstration in uh, general. So what we see is that the person has fainted. For this person to have been fainted, we remember we have to do the safety protocol, put on 
your gloves. Put on your face shield if it is available. Bring the person back at your first point and obtain an open airway. Hello, can you hear me? Obviously, the person is not hearing me. The next thing is for me to bring this person out of this chair and bring her down to a side position. Why do we need to put her on her side? It's because she in herself might have lost uh, uh, oxygen. So we want to make sure that she gets back oxygen and want to make sure that there's no obstruction on the airway. So we will put this hand on angle 90 and we will use this hand to support her. Why we open the airway? Because whatever happens to somebody when he's unconscious, this is where the damage comes from. You need to open the airway like uh, my colleague in the studio explained to make sure that there is free flow of oxygen. Once you do this, forget about the tongue. The tongue is already out of the airway. It's not going to block it. Make sure that you get off anything around the person, straighten the leg of the person, and give the person a balance. When you give the person a balance like this, with this leg, this person will not be able to fall backward, uh, fall forward, neither will the person fall backward. What is the objective of this? First is to make sure that the jaw is forward. And when the jaw is forward, it means that the person has free flow of oxygen. You remember if you're sleeping at night with a very long pillow, you might just wake up in the night, start coughing. It's because that pillow has brought your head forward and it's already causing obstruction to your respiratory system. The second is that you should allow the mat to be low. The mat should be low so that the, any secretion, if somebody is unconscious, the person is not able to control the saliva that the mat will produce. So it flows out voluntarily uh, on its own. Then the, the chest should be off the ground. If you see now, our chest is not on the ground. I will explain this specifically to every lay responder out there. Immediately you turn the person like this, the chest bone in front falls out. And this hand helps to suspend the shoulder blade. The heart and the lungs are like two balloons in the middle. So once you do this, they, 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 they contrast and pump freely on their own. In as much as this person is breathing, which you will continue to monitor. In as, as you put the person down, you could put your uh, hand behind the, uh, the back of your hand on the person's nose to feel for warm air. If you don't feel for warm air, it means that you will need to turn the person and do a secondary uh, 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 assessment. But for anybody who fainted, you just need to put your hands and be sure that the person is breathing. You call for help. Remember, put into consideration Anybody, in time of emergency, there are three stages. You have the basic life support, which is the person who is there who will be able to do first aid. You have my colleague in the studio in the Lagos, who is a trained paramedic, who will come with all the arts, outside hospital equipment to come and rescue the person because the lay first aider will need to transfer the person to the ambulance team. But what the ambulance team will get is as a result of the effective service that this person is giving from the first stage. So all you need to do is remember, put the person down, ensure that the person is breathing, make sure that the person's airway is open, make sure that the mouth is low to allow secretion, and make sure that the chest is allowed free. to flow freely. Okay. In the All right, advanced Paul. stage is when the person becomes unconscious. Okay, Paul. Paul, will bring you back for this demonstration to continue. Um, Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Augustine. I want to get her name. Adube Augustine, a paramedic of Rescue Technologies Limited. Thank you for coming. Um, from our Abuja studio, the man who was doing the demonstration. And we'll get, try and get you guys back again because there are other parts of the first aid thing we need to look at again. We'll have to get you guys back. Paul Urukamaya, he's a state head of training, field officer, International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts with us. We really have to go at this point in time. Thank you. So as we're back in a moment, please stay with us.